Hello, and welcome back. Today we're starting Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is about right triangle trigonometry, and this might be the trigonometry that you're familiar with from as far back as Algebra 1. In Algebra 1 and Geometry, and even perhaps in a college math class, you may have been introduced to SOHCAHTOA, which is an abbreviation for sine, cosine, and tangents ratios. So let me go ahead and write SOHCAHTOA on the board and explain it if you haven't already seen it or learned it. SOHCAHTOA. The S in SO means sine, the sine function. So this black word SO means sine of some angle. And now the O means opposite. And the H means hypotenuse. So from the word SO, we can remember that the sine of theta is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. Similarly, cosine from ka, the C stands for cosine, just like the S stands for sine. The A means adjacent, so adjacent. Again, the H is hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is equal to adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So now lastly, we get the tangent. The T is for tangent. O, again, O is opposite. And A is adjacent. So you need, to, you need to know sine, cosine, and tangents, triangles, ratios by heart. And the easy way to remember them is through the word SOHCAHTOA, which is an abbreviation word. Okay, so now how do we use SOHCAHTOA? Okay, so we are back now to my open math. Here is homework two, question number one. In this problem, we are told that side A is equal to 2. So we'll go ahead and label side A 2. Side B is equal to 8. And then to get side C, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem. So 4 plus 64 is 68. That means that C is equal to the square root of 68. 68 is divisible by 4, so that becomes 2 root 17 because 4 times 17 is 68. Okay, so now we label this side 2 root 17. So the sine of A, here is A right here. Let's highlight A, and this is angle A. Which side is opposite angle A? This one right here, right? So this would be the opposite side to angle A. And in fact, you'll often see this, that a capital letter is going to be standard for an angle, and the side opposite that angle will be represented by the lowercase letter. So here we have angle B, capital B, opposite side B, little b. Little b represents the measure of the side, and capital A and capital B are the measure of those angles. So side A is opposite angle A, side B is then the adjacent side. Of course, there are two adjacent sides. 
B and C are both adjacent to angle A, but side C is the hypotenuse. Remember that the hypotenuse is the side opposite the right angle. So the hypotenuse is never going to be the adjacent side. The adjacent side is going to be the side that's adjacent to the angle, but is not the hypotenuse. So once you have these labels here, and you can either label your diagram directly, or you can just remember these by looking at it in your head. If you're pretty familiar with this concept, you may not need to label the sides, but if this is a new concept for you, then I highly recommend you label the sides. So now we come to sine. Remember SOHCAHTOA. So sine is so, and the sine then of theta in this case, it's going to be sine of A, is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So what is opposite A? 2. And what is the hypotenuse? 2 root 17. So this will reduce to 1 over root 17, and then when you rationalize the denominator, that becomes root 17 over 17. Of course, if you're doing this on my open math, you're going to type it in here, but there's no way I'm going to fit that. Okay, so remember that sine and cosecant are reciprocals, right? So if this reduced to 1 over root 17, then you can flip that over before you rationalize the denominator, and that becomes root 17 over 1. In other words, this one right here is just root 17. Okay, now let's look at cosine. Cosine is ka, so ka toa, which means that the cosine of a is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So which side is adjacent? The side labeled 8 is adjacent. So we have adjacent over hypotenuse. You can see that this one right here is four times as big as this one right here. So you can just multiply this answer right here by 4. 4 root 17 over 17. These sorts of observations will save you time. And when you flip this over, you'll get secant, right? Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. This is 4 over root 17, so when you flip it over, it becomes root 17 over 4. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't flip this one over and then have to rationalize another denominator. Flip this one over before you rationalize the denominator, and that will give you a irrational number in the numerator to start with. Okay, and lastly we have tangent. Tangent is Toa, and remember that tangent then is opposite over adjacent, so the tangent of A is opposite over adjacent, the opposite side is 2, the adjacent side is 8, so this one has no irrational number, 1 fourth. Of course, the reciprocal of 1 fourth is just 4. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So that's how you use SOHCAHTOA. Okay, the next topic is cofunctions. Cofunctions are pairs of functions that have a relationship with complementary angles. So sine and cosine, tangent and cotangent, secant, and cosecant. These are not reciprocal functions, they are cofunctions.
And the relationship between them is found on page 54. So this is how it works. If you have the sine of an angle, that angle's sine will be equal to the cosine of the complement of theta. Okay? Now what that means as a tangible example is that if you have the sine of, uh, let's say, 10 degrees, what is the complement of 10 degrees? 80 degrees. So that means that the sine of 10 degrees equals the cosine of 80 degrees. And you can do this with any of these pairs, sine and cosine, tangent and cotangent, secant and cosecant. So, for example, you could say that the tangent of 20 degrees has to be equal to the cotangent of 70 degrees. Notice 20 and 70 are complements. So you can switch it back and forth like this. Okay, so now let's do a problem from the book. Actually, let's first make a correction. Not page 54, page 49. So, sorry, if you were looking on page 54, we are going to do a problem now on page 54. But page 49 is where you will find the theory for co-functions. Next, I will set up a problem from page 54. Okay, here is number 34 from page 54. It might be a little intimidating at first, particularly because we have a Greek letter. This is the Greek letter beta. Just think of it as a very fancy B, okay? Don't change the variables to something else. Just stick with the variables that the book gives you. You do need to become accustomed to these Greek letters throughout trigonometry, and even in calculus, you're going to continue to use Greek symbols. It's just a symbol. symbol. Do not be intimidated by a symbol. Okay, so secant of beta plus 10 degrees is equal to cosecant of 2 beta plus 20 degrees. This is already given to me as true. And the directions say, find one solution for each equation. Because there's actually an infinite number of possibilities for what beta can equal because of the idea of coterminal angles. You can keep going around and around and keep coming back to the same values for secant and cosecant. But all we have to do is find one true solution. So remember that secant and cosecant are co functions. What that means is that this angle here and this angle here are complementary angles. Just as before I was showing you 10 degrees and 80 degrees, 20 degrees and 70 degrees, remember how they added up to 90? So that means that beta plus 10 degrees and 2 beta plus 20 degrees have to add up to 90. Here's beta plus 10 degrees. Here's 2 beta plus 20 degrees. These add up to 90. Now it becomes a very simple linear algebra problem. Not linear algebra problem. A linear equation problem from algebra. Linear algebra is more like a 400 level math course and that is a lot harder. Okay, so 3 beta plus 30 is equal to 90 degrees. So 3 beta is equal to 60 beta is equal to 20. Now you can check to see if this is reasonable. If you plug 20 in, you get 30 degrees here. And if you plug 20 over here, you end up with 60 degrees. And of course, 30 degrees and 60 degrees are complementary, so then you know you did this problem correctly. At some point in one of your classes, you should have learned about special triangles, that is, the 30-60-90 triangles and the 45-45-90 triangles. They have ratios that you should memorize. We're going to be using them quite a lot. Let me just quickly remind you of what the ratios are in these triangles. A 30-60-90 degree triangle is called a 30-60-90 degree triangle because it has one angle that is 30, one angle that is 60, 
and one angle that is 90. And of course, when you have triangles that have the same angle measurement, all triangles that are 30, 60, 90 degrees will be similar to each other in, in the technical geometric sense of the word, right? By the angle, angle similarity postulate. So what that means is that all of them will have the same ratio for the sides. And the ratio is 1 to root 3 to 2. Now remember this. The smallest side of a triangle is always opposite the smallest angle. And the biggest side of an angle is always opposite the biggest angle. And remember that 2 is bigger than the square root of 3 because the square root of 4 is bigger than the square root of 3. So here's the mama, uh, sorry, here's the baby angle, baby side, mama angle, mama side, papa angle, papa side. This is, this is just like the three bears. Okay, so now let's look at the 45, 45, 90. 45, 45, 90 is an isosceles right triangle, the only type of isosceles right triangle. 45 degrees, 45 degrees, 90 degrees. And the side ratios here are 1 to 1 to root 2. Okay, now I'm going to put a problem up from the book and we will apply the ratios of these triangles. Okay, so from page 55, here's number 74. We have one side length given to us, 24. And we need to find the missing side lengths A, B, C, and D. So first, notice that we have two triangles within the big triangle. This triangle right here, because this is 60 degrees and this is 90 degrees, we can conclude that this one up here must be 30 degrees. So then that gives us a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And the other one is already given to us as a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So we're going to get to use both of these triangles in this problem. So first, let's focus on the triangle on the left, because the triangle on the left actually has one side length that's given to us. So this side is the longest side. It's the Papa Bear side, because it's opposite the right angle. So I can set up a proportion that... 24 is to A, this is Papa Bear is to Baby Bear as, and I'll come up here, the Papa Bear is a 2 and the Baby Bear is a 1, so 2 over 1. Again, Papa Bear is to Baby Bear as Papa Bear is to Baby Bear, so 24 is to A as 2 is to 1. So that means that A, of course, must be and this is an observation that you can make. The short side of a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle will always be one half of the long side. So anytime you know the long side, you can go straight to the short side by dividing by 2. And anytime you know the short side, you can go straight to the long side by multiplying by 2. Similarly, you don't have to set up a proportion solve for B. Just look at this relationship right here. Root 3 and 1. The mama bear side is root 3 times the baby bear side. So if we know that this is 12, then B must be root 3 times 12. In other words, B is going to have to be 12 root 3. You see that ratio? 12 root 3 to 12 is the same as root 3 to 1. Now, this is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, so of course B has to be equal to D because these two sides are congruent. So that makes D equal to 12 root 3. And then what about C? Let's do another proportion. The hypotenuse is root 2 times the short side. Well, you can do proportion or you can just multiply by root 2. I'm going to do a proportion and then I will multiply by root 2 to show you both ways. So if you do a proportion, then you will do uh, hypotenuse 
is to leg as hypotenuse is to leg. So hypotenuse is to leg as hypotenuse is to leg. So then when you multiply that, that, that becomes the same thing as multiplying the leg 12 root 3 by root 2. And that gives you that C is equal to 12 root 6. And that concludes that problem. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on to 2.2. And we're going to start with talking about reference angles. Reference angles in 2.2 are found on page 57 for starters. A reference angle is the angle that is found with reference to the X axis. If you were to drop a perpendicular from the terminal side of your angle to the X axis, you would find a reference angle. And that's going to help you find an angle. All right, so this sounds a little complicated, so let's get started. But let me let me move this up here a bit so I actually have a little bit more space to work. Um, you know what? I think I'll do... Let's start with question number seven first because this will be a little less complicated. Okay, so let's look at 221 degrees for starters. Where is 221 degrees? Here's zero degrees. 90 degrees. So let me put my positive or my initial side. Here's the initial side of my angle. Okay, so now we're going to be going to 221. There's 90, 180, and 270. So between 180 and 270, I have this angle here, and this angle is 221 degrees. Okay, so what you want to do to find a reference angle is first start with an angle between 0 and 360. Then you're going to drop a perpendicular from some point here on this terminal side, it doesn't matter where, drop it all the way to the x-axis, only ever to the x-axis, okay? This is a big red flag. Let me draw you a red flag. This is my mouse art. Okay. X axis only. This only works dropping a perpendicular to the x axis. So here's my perpendicular to the x axis. All right, so what we want to do is try to figure out what the reference angle is. And the reference angle I'm going to call that reference angle theta. Okay, and it's, it's that angle right there. So how do you find that angle right there? You take 221 and you subtract 180 from it. It is not always the case that you subtract 180 to find the reference angle. So do not generalize that in order to find a reference angle, all you have to do is subtract 180. Now it's better to draw a diagram and figure it out by looking at it. Okay, so now what about 308 degrees? Here's my initial side. This is 90, 180, 270, 308 is going to be down here. So this is 308 degrees. I need to drop a perpendicular to the x-axis from a point on the terminal side. And now it may be a little hard to see here, but this angle right here that I'm coloring in red is the angle that is going to be my reference angle. And so to get that angle right there, you need to take 
360 degrees and subtract from 360 degrees 308 degrees. Drawing a picture is really the best way to do this because you'll get an intuitive sense of what to do. All you have to do to figure out what's left in the circle is take the amount of the circle you, you've used up so far and subtract it from 360. That's what I'm doing. So then I get a 52 degree angle. So the reference angle for 308 degrees is 52 degrees. Okay, and if you have a negative angle, it will work the same way. You're going to drop a perpendicular. So your reference angle will always be between 0 and 90 because it's going to be an angle of a right triangle. Okay, let me erase all this so I can show you how to do a negative angle. Erase. Okay, here we go. Let's draw our axes. Wow, that's creative. Not creative. Um, I don't know what the word is. Sloppy. There we go. Okay, I just need to try this again. Take two. Now, I give myself a certain amount of slack for my sloppiness here because I'm trying to write using a mouse. But in your handwritten work, you are using an instrument that you've used since at least kindergarten. A pencil or a pen. So unless you've had the need to switch hands because you've sprained a wrist, you should have neater writing than this. Okay, so here's your positive x-axis. And to go 151 degrees in the negative direction means that we're going this way. Not a full 180. We're stopping short of the 180. So that is 100 and that's negative 151 degrees. So now I'm going to take my terminal side and drop a perpendicular to the x axis and my reference angle is going to be the angle right in there. So to get this one we're going to take the 180 degrees right here and we will subtract 151 from it. Not negative 151 because if I'm looking at this from a geometric sense, this is a linear pair. So the linear pair is going to be a 151 degree angle and a, another angle that add up to 180 degrees. They're also supplementary. Linear pairs are always supplementary. Okay, so that's 29 degrees. So notice that sometimes you subtract 180, sometimes you subtract from 180, sometimes 360. So just draw a diagram. It's going to be the best way to try to figure it out. So that's this one right here. Now how do you use reference angles? Okay, so if you're coming down here now to question number 8, the first thing you're going to want to do is probably just go ahead and find a coterminal angle. That's something you can do by adding 720. So the sine of negative 660 is the same thing as taking the sine of negative 660 plus, this is all still inside the parentheses, that's a 6, 720. Why am I adding 720? I need to add multiples of 360 onto negative 660 until I am in the 0 to 360 range. And now I have the sine of 60 degrees. And I actually do not need to find a reference angle for 60 degrees. If you have an angle between 0 and 90, you already have your reference angle. The whole idea of a reference angle is that you'll end up with an angle that's in a triangle between 0 and 90. So what is the sine of 60 degrees? Well, let's go back to the triangle here. Here is 60 degrees. You remember the ratios? This side is root 3. That's the mama bear side. This is 1. That's the baby bear side. And this is 2. That's the papa bear. Sine is opposite 
over hypotenuse, right? So, opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite of 60 degrees is root 3. Hypotenuse is 2. So the exact value of the sine of 60 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. So next let's move on to question number 9. Okay. So first of all, I need to find something coterminal. So if I add positive 720, that's not going to be enough. Well, actually, I could do that. I could end up with a negative angle and just find the reference angle. Sure, why not? If we add 720 degrees, what do we end up with? Negative 135, right? I'm running low on coffee this morning. Let me double check that on the calculator. I try not to use calculators very often because I like to keep my brain alert. But sometimes, like you know, when you're giving a lecture, it's worthwhile to make sure you, you use the correct numbers. Okay, so that's correct. Now let's find that. Here's my initial side. If I go back, negative 135 degrees. Drop a perpendicular to the x-axis. The angle that is right here, this angle, the reference angle, is 180 minus 135, and that is equal to 45 degrees. You should expect for questions 8 and 9 to get 30, 60, or 45 as your reference angle every time, because the whole point of questions 8 and 9 are computing exact values, which means you need to be using one of the special triangles. So if you do not end up with a reference angle of 30, 45, or 60, then you've done something wrong. I guess you could get 0 or 90, but I don't remember if um, those are being used in these problems. Okay, anyway, 45 degrees. Let's remember the 45 degree the 45, 45, 90 triangle. The 45, 45, 90 triangle, which can also be marked like this because those two angles are congruent. The sides are in ratio 1 to 1 to root 2. So here, the sine of 45, this is a 45 degree angle, is going to be, okay, so this is going to be the same thing as the sine of 45 degrees because of the reference angle. That's what the reference angle does for us. The opposite of 45 degrees is 1, and the hypotenuse is root 2. And then when we rationalize, we end up with square root of 2 over 2. Now, if this seems like a lot of work, once you memorize the unit circle, you can come up with these answers instantaneously in your head. It's very exciting. So like if you're doing number 10, for instance, and you need to figure out what the cosine of 60 is and the cosecant of 30, you're thinking, oh my goodness, that's going to be a lot of work. Well, once you've memorized the unit circle, then you will have all these answers immediately in your head. Uh, I'm going to erase all this real quick. Ta-da! That's instant erasing. What is the unit circle? Google it. It's beautiful. When I was in trigonometry in high school, every single day, our teacher gave us a quiz. I don't know, it was about two weeks or three weeks at a time. And he would give us the unit circle, and then he made us label every single coordinate. And we had two minutes to do it 
every day. So it was like the equivalent of a third grade times table quiz. So when you go through and you memorize where every single point is on the unit circle and you can just throw it out really quickly, um, yeah, it, then any time I wanted to do a trig problem, it was very quick. Now this is an open notes course. I have to do that when it's online because how else am I going to get you to actually follow that policy of, I can't get you to not look at notes. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, if I'm looking at 60 degrees, where is 60 degrees? 60 degrees is here. We will more formally study the unit circle, but you might as well start getting used to it. Here's 60 degrees. That's 60 degrees. The coordinates of that point, that's supposed to say 60. Okay, the coordinates of this point right here are one half root 3 over 2. Now the x-coordinate of the point will always be the cosine value and the y-coordinate will always be the sine value. So here I'm going to now say that I have four parentheses. I'm going to square whatever the cosine of 60 is. Now remember here's 60 degrees the x-coordinate always represents cosine. So that tells me that the cosine of 60 degrees is one half. Okay, so now I keep going and I need to figure out what the cosecant of 30 degrees is. So the way I figure out cosecant of 30 is I figure out what the sine of 30 is and then flip it over. So how do I find the sine of 30? Well, you could do that a couple ways. You could use, use co-functions, right? Do you remember this, that the uh, cosine of 60... Okay, I'm trying this again. That's horrible. Cosine of 60... Horrible, but a little, a little less is equal to the sine of 30 degrees. That's co functions right there. So I already know since the cosine of 60 is one half that the sine of 30 is also one half. But if you use the unit circle, what you can do, here's the initial side, here's the terminal side for 30 degrees. You can look at the point, the coordinates of this point right here is uh, root 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. And the y value is always going to be the sine value. So one half is the sine value of 30 degrees. Okay, either way, I know that the sine of 30 is one half. So I'm going to put it right here as 2 over 1. Why 2 over 1? Well, you don't have to write 2 over 1, you could just write 2. But I put 2 over 1 to emphasize to you that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if sine of 30 is 1 half, then the cosecant of 30 is 2 over 1. And in the end, 1 half squared is 1 fourth. 1 fourth times 4 is 1. And then we have 2 squared is 4 times 12 is 48. And then we end up with 49. That is supposed to be an 8. I am not a big fan of writing with a mouse. I will be returning to the whiteboard shortly. Ta-da! Okay, so I just did a Google search for unit circle, and a lot of images came up. You can take your pick. Uh, what looks nice? This one looks nice. Okay, 
this is a very nice unit circle. I would recommend you find one that's nice and clear and print it out so you can have it in front of you at all times. So what you can do is you can see on the unit circle all of these coordinates. And all of those coordinates, the x coordinates, all refer to the cosine of the value at these degrees right here. These other ones are radians. We'll study radians later. And the y coordinates represent the uh, sine values. Okay, so what does this have to do with the next problem? Plot the points where sine is equal to negative one half. So what you want to do is you go to a unit circle and you look for where are the locations where the sine value is one, negative one half. Okay, you can see right here that the y value here is negative one half, and the y value here is negative one half. Remember, y values correspond to sine. Okay, that's supposed to say sine. I'm going to try again. This is sine. Now that looks like 8. Try that again. The y values correspond to sine. So for my problem, I just need to plot this point right here and this point right here. So now let's go to my open math. Sine is negative one half right here and right here. Okay, so then I can go over here to this next problem and I need to know where is the secant of theta equal to negative root two. Now, remember that secant and cosine are reciprocals. So this is the same as saying that uh, the cosine of theta is equal to 1 over negative root 2. When you rationalize that, it becomes negative root 2 over 2. Okay, so I'm going to look on the unit circle now for x values because x on the unit circle corresponds to the cosine of theta. So I will go and find x values okay that's theta x values of negative root 2 over 2. Hmm, here's an x value of negative root 2 over 2. Notice that is at 135 degrees. And here is an x value of negative root 2 over 2. And that is at 225 degrees. So now I go back over here and I do this point here and this point here. Okay, now... The book has not introduced the unit circle yet, so you may wonder why I am. It's better to get exposure to the unit circle early. But if you look at page 61, page 61 has this example here that shows you how to find an angle measure uh, given an interval and a function value. So they're trying to find all of the locations where the cosine of theta is equal to negative root 2 over 2. So you can use your book using example 6 
they have their own technique that does not use the unit circle. Instead, it uses uh, the special reference angles. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to solve these types of equations. Here's number 62 from page 63. We need to find all the occurrences of theta where the cosine of theta is equal to the square root of 3 over 2. So one of the ways you can do that without using the unit circle, the unit circle would be the fastest, easiest way of doing this, is remember that cosine of theta represents the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? So we're looking for root 3 over 2 is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So what you should think to yourself is, oh yeah, the square root of 3 and, and 2, that's from a 30-60-90 triangle. So you draw yourself your 30-60-90 triangle. And now you say to yourself, is it 30 or 60 that has an adjacent... Okay, I drew this wrong. <laughs> the largest side is supposed to be the biggest number. Okay, make sure that you draw your reference triangle correctly. Okay, so here we go. Is it the 30 degree angle or the 60 degree angle that has an adjacent side of the square root of 3. This one right here, right? Look, the adjacent side is the square root of 3. And then this one is the hypotenuse. So that tells me that theta is equal to 30 degrees. Ta-da! Except that the directions say all values between 0 and 360. Ah, hmm, how do we do that? Well, what we're going to have to do is look at the full 360 degree circle. If you have a, 60, uh, a 30 degree angle, here's your 30 degree angle, and if you drop down a perpendicular here, then you see it as a right triangle with a, an adjacent side of root 3 and a hypotenuse of root 2. Well, where else do you see this same situation? My triangle is clearly, I mean, my, my circle is lacking some symmetry here. Right here, if I were to take this angle right here and drop a perpendicular, I would also see that it has an adjacent side of root 3 and a hypotenuse of 2. What is this angle? This angle is going all the way around. But this is congruent to this, uh, this angle right here is congruent to this angle. Let me bring this a little closer so you can see it. These two angles right here are congruent. You can get this from geometry. But this is, this is bisecting the angle here. So that this means also this is a 30 degree angle. This is in fact a negative 30 degrees because you go uh, clockwise. So that means that this angle that goes around here that's coterminal with negative 30 is a positive 330. So that's your second answer. Your two answers are 30 degrees and 330. Let me say this. You do need to know how to work with 30, 60, 30, 60, 90, and 45, 45, 90 triangles. But if you can, please just jump into the unit circle use as soon as possible. So again, what you'd want to do is just Google image search unit circle print one out, try to use it as much as you can for the problems. Uh, you could even try looking at YouTube videos on how to use the unit circle. I will be lecturing more on the unit circle, but right now the book is wanting you to figure out these problems exclusively through reference triangles, 
uh, and also reference angles, the special triangles and reference angles. And that's actually complicated and challenging more than it needs to be. If you could just learn the unit circle, you can get the answers uh, right away. Now we're going to move on to 2.3. And the first thing you want to do is make sure that you have a calculator. It needs to be either a scientific calculator or a graphing calculator. I recommend this one because I'm using it. Uh, the Matsu College Library will check this out to you for free. And on this, you will see that we have a mode button. Okay, The mode button is right there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the mode button. And when I push the mode button, I'll see that the third option down is a radian or degrees. It's very important right now that your calculator is in degree mode. If it's not in degree mode, then you will be getting incorrect answers. So for chapter two, make sure that you are in degree mode. Once you check your mode, then you can find sine, cosine, and tangent, the approximate values of sine, cosine, and tangent on your calculator. And that's what 2.3 is about, okay? So when you go to my open math and it asks you to find a value, so for instance, let's flip over there, question number 14, the tangent of 36 degrees, 30 minutes, 35 seconds. So what are you going to type into your calculator? Well, you're going to type tangent of 36 plus 30 over 60 plus 35 over 36 hundred. Okay, I will write that down right here for you so you can see that. So we're going to type into the calculator tangent thirty six plus that's the degrees. Now we have to take these minutes and turn them into degrees. So thirty divided by sixty converts minutes to degrees. Okay? Next we have thirty five seconds and we need to convert 35 seconds to a decimal, so we're going to take 35 and divide it by 3600, because remember, there are 3600 seconds in an hour. That means there are 3600 seconds in a degree. That's supposed to say 3600. Okay, then you type that into the calculator and push enter, and if you're in the correct mode, you should end up with um, 0 0.7402. It would be helpful if that actually is not showing up. Okay, so anyway, I will show you now on my calculator. Oh dear, what's happening? Let me pause this. Okay, so this is what I got when I typed it into the calculator. So you can practice using the calculator to get your approximate values. Okay, so here's number 64 from 2.3. So this is page 67. We need to figure out the sine of theta is equal to this decimal point. We need to figure out which theta value will generate that decimal point. Okay, and we only have to find the answer uh, at first between 0 and 90, and then we'll use that answer to figure out uh, both answers between 0 and 360. Okay, so what we're going to do is we have to use the sign inverse button on the calculator. So on my calculator, above the, the, above the button that says sign is a little symbol for sign inverse. And you can get to any uh, above the button symbol by using shift or second. So I'm going to use the second button on the calculator to get here on my screen. I should have a sign inverse 
and then I'm going to type in uh, this number right here. So this number of 0 0.52991926, I type that into the calculator. Sign inverse of 0.52991926 uh, is going to give me roughly 32 degrees because it says round to the nearest degree. Okay, so I'm going to use, let's use the approximate. This is approximately 32 degrees. That's one of my answers. I have to find both answers between 0 and 360. So this is not just a calculator problem. Now I need to look at the circle. If I have a sine value right here at 32 degrees, Remember that sine corresponds to y. So we're trying to find another angle with an identical y value. Okay. Now the y value right here is this one right here. That's 0.5299 blah blah blah. So what other point on the circle will have the exact same y value? Well, it's right over here. This angle right here must be congruent to this angle right here, and so this is a 32 degree angle as well. So how do I figure out what this angle that goes from here to here is? I subtract 32 from 180, and I end up with 148 degrees. So both 32 degrees and 148 degrees end up being uh, the answers to this problem. And this is a little bit of a challenging concept, but uh, we will continue to explore it before the test. Don't worry. You're going to see this in multiple different ways communicated to you, and hopefully it will click, uh, click in some way. I encourage you also to watch the My Open Math videos. They may have uh, some explanations for you. Um, in this textbook, they're going to be explaining it uh, in 2.3. Uh, first, example two just tells you how to find something between 0 and 90. And then to generalize that to 0 and 360, then you have to go back to 2.2, example six again, and, and use the same sort of concept. Okay, so lastly, we're going to do grade resistance. And grade resistance is a physics concept that uses sine, cosine, and tangent. So let me show you that real fast. So this is page uh, 68, number 70. We, are, we have a vehicle that's 2,400 pounds, and it's going downhill because in the problem we're given that we have a negative 2.4 degree uh, incline or decline. It's a downhill grade of negative 2.4 degrees. I drew it as a positive number because when you draw triangles, you represent even negative angles for a downhill as a positive number in your triangle. And this is not drawn to scale. Okay, so what we have is there's resistance. We have vectors. We have the gravity vector, and then we have the amount that the, the car is pushing against the road itself, okay? And these vectors uh, between gravity and then the pushing against the road itself, you have these different vectors and they form a right triangle. And it's a, it's a very fun and interest, interesting explanation. But for the purpose of time here, I'm going to just accelerate this to a formula for you. And if you want to understand the trig behind it, uh, it's, a, it's a delightful thing to try to figure out the vectors and, and how it works. I did it uh, when I first taught this course a, a few years ago, and I had quite a lot of fun with it. Uh, but then when I went to explain it to the students, they sort of had the glazed over look, and I thought, aha, maybe in this case we just get, get by with the formula and focus on more important things. So that's what I did. I focused more on the other topics today and less on grade resistance. But the formula which is found on page 65, is that this force of resistance, which is grade resistance, is F, okay? 
and then that is going to be W sine of theta. And W represents the weight of the automobile, which is 2,400 pounds. And then we have your theta value, which is going to be uh, Sorry, so the theta value is negative 2.4 degrees. The idea is that if you're traveling uphill versus downhill, it's actually going to give you a different grade resistance. So here, if you put this in, no, you don't want to put negative, you want to put positive. My bad. It's not giving you a difference. I don't know why I said that. Here we go. Say this again. This is positive. And that's going to be 100.5 pounds of grade resistance. So actually, traveling uphill and downhill really does not make a difference to grade resistance. But if you put it in a negative angle, you'll get a negative uh, 100 pounds. And so it just has to do with Okay, so I was saying a few things because I was getting a little distracted. So let me make this a little more clear. There is a difference in the positive and the negative sign for uphill and downhill. The absolute values of the values themselves uh, don't matter. A 100-pound force is still a 100-pound force, okay? However, when you are traveling uphill, you will express grade resistance through a positive value and you express a downhill movement with a negative grade resistance. So here I've written uphill for 2.4 degrees, and here I've written downhill with negative 2.4 degrees. And here's a better diagram to help explain it. Okay, you can see this a lot more clearly. The grade resistance is F equals W sine alpha. The idea is that if you're traveling uphill, you are being resisted by a positive force. So gravity is working against you. If you are traveling downhill, you are not being resisted by a positive force. Gravity is actually helping you downhill. So grade resistance is negative, because if you have a negative resistance, it's the same thing as being helped. So that, that should go back to your intuition. If I'm going uphill on a slope, the slope is resisting, causing resistance. If I'm going downhill on a slope, a negative resistance means I'm being helped along. And that's why you want to have a negative value for grade resistance when you're traveling downhill and you want to have a positive value for grade resistance when you're traveling uphill. Okay, so hopefully this picture made it uh, a lot more understandable. All right, so that's it for today. And this is a uh, online education is still kind of new to me, and I'm hoping that my lectures will continue to improve. Uh, feel free to send me feedback and comments. Send me emails about what you think I can do better or what I'm already doing okay and what you'd like to see more of because I would love to try to make these uh, lectures as good as possible for you. I want you to succeed in this course, and I also want to learn to be the best online instructor I can be. Okay, have a great weekend, and I will see you next week.